The facility is an unassuming yellowish brick building located across the street from a neighborhood. It would be extremely easy to miss altogether if you weren't paying close attention to the sign on the road. And given the name on the sign, you might have thoughts of Frankenstein fish with multiple eyes or some other kind of experimental aquatic monstrosities being created in these labs. However, the truth is that while this facility isn't growing creatures from a horror movie, the work done here is equally as interesting and very important. This is Wild, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is episode 17, The Fisheries Experiment Station. Welcome back to Wild. I'm here at the Fisheries Experiment Station today up in Logan. Just got to have a fun little tour, kind of walk through this facility. And I'm with Wade Cavender. He's the DWR Fisheries Experiment Station Director. So thanks for having me today, Wade. <laughs> oh, thank, thanks for coming out. Yeah, this is awesome. It is a very unassuming facility. Like it, there's like houses across the street like I would have had no idea this was here <laughs> you guys are kind of hidden back here <laughs> we are kind of hidden usually folks uh, they refer to it just the old the old hatchery location because they drive by going 60 and they just most people just don't realize who we are or, or what we do totally yeah you guys are a little hidden gym up here how long have you worked for the division Wade I've been with the division just over 15 years. I've been the director of FES for the last five, and before that I was the program manager for the fish health program here here at the station. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. So here at the station, you've been here for a while. Yep. My entire time with the Division of Wildlife has been here at FES. Yep, that's awesome. Correct. Okay. And kind of explain what it is that, that you do for the division. Sure. As you mentioned, uh, you know, my, my working title is that I'm the director of the experiment station. Just to give you a little, uh, some additional background, FES was built in the 60s. As you've done your tour around, you can see, you've seen that some of the, some of the buildings are a little bit older, but we're slowly but surely updating. One of the things that was unique about the station is when it was built, it was primarily a, a fish hatchery. And then over time, the Division of Wildlife realized we really have a need for fish health testing and also uh, aquatic research, which over time, as that developed, that's what turned into the fisheries experiment station. Those three components is essentially what we, we manage on a, on a daily basis here in northern Utah. Gotcha. And so for somebody who doesn't know, who's never heard of this, you know, it kind of sounds like something out of a Frankenstein movie, just <laughs> doing some kind of experiments up here. Talk a little bit about about some of those different things that, that you guys do here. Sure. Just uh, uh, one other aspect I'll, I'll mention, just because we've had some recent changes here. So we still do have the fish culture facility, as you've seen, uh, raise a number of different species, including a June sucker, bluehead sucker. Uh, we do a lot of cutthroat and rainbow trout work. Just recently, in the past two years, we have basically transferred supervisor resp responsibility of the hatchery to back to Salt Lake, mainly because FES being research and fish health is going to likely move down the road. Now, with that being said, the culture program is still active, and with the experiment station, the research and fish health are, are fairly unique in the state. I'm not sure if many of your listeners know this, but it's, it's actually illegal to pick up a live fish and move it to another location without them being health certified. So that pertains to anglers, it pertains to the Division of Wildlife. So what we do is we send out a crew of people who will uh, basically collect tissue samples, bring them back to the lab where they're examined for viruses, bacteria, and parasites. And based on the findings, that gives us the ability to provide a, a pathogen-free certification. It uh, gives permission for uh, basically our program to move fish as needed. Now, and of course, if we find a pathogen of concern, then there's a whole other road that we need to go down, which is, you know, restricting transfers, things along those lines. And we use this a lot for like our fish stocking as well, right? We, like we'll raise the fish in the hatcheries and then before we stock them, we make sure they're tested and healthy and you guys do that aspect. That is exactly right. We have a, a full uh, full service lab here at the station. So we're able to 
examine all those all those samples right here on site and then our fish health program manager and myself are the ones that provide the certification that allows them to go ahead and transfer those fish gotcha and do most state you know wildlife fish agencies do they have their own kind of certification testing health stuff like this or is this kind of a unique thing to utah no, it's it's not unique to Utah. It's, in fact, it, throughout the West, there are a number of different states that also have virtually identical programs, uh, identical policies. And then on a more national basis, as you move back east, you see similar programs, but you also see the use of some private, uh, privatized fish health testing laboratories. If you look at it as a whole, it's a mix across the across the country. So with the the disease testing, I guess that falls under the health aspect of, of your work. Correct, it does. And the other aspect of the hatchery program and our fish health program that we are involved in is the diagnostic component. So if you if you think about the number of hatcheries we have and all the fish we raise, there are situations where we see mortality or basically sick fish. Gotcha. And when that happens, the managers call us and, and ask, okay, can you tell us what's going on? Can we come up with a treatment? And what do we do to alleviate these problems? And that's where, again, Christy, the, the fish health manager and myself come into play to try and identify the problem and come up with an appropriate treatment. I see. And so this is kind of a naive question. I'm obviously not a biologist <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. But let's say, you know, there's some kind of disease or sick fish or whatever in one of the hatcheries and you guys are able to diagnose it. Like you mentioned, is there are you able to kind of put together vaccines or treatments or whatever to help those? Or usually is that just you know, there's nothing that can be done for those fish. No, no. There's a, a number of different treatments depending on what we find that allow us to do just what I mentioned, alleviate the problem and, and really get them back on the straight and narrow. And we work very closely also with our managers to make sure that biosecurity, fish densities are appropriate, water chemistry is, you know, where it needs to be. So there's, a, there's really a lot of things that we can do. And uh, interesting you mentioned the vaccine component because when we talk a little bit about research, one of the things we've done over the years is we've had a great collaboration between our, our separate research program and our fish health program where we have developed a vaccine that we administer to our adult fish. And without getting into too much of the detail, what, what we're doing is we're injecting the fish with the vaccine. It produces an antibody. We believe it helps to protect the juveniles as they're, as they're born and produced in the hatcheries. I see. And so it's like their version of a flu shot kind of. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and we, we do that in combination with many, many other things. And we can talk about that a little bit later when we get into research. But it's been, it's been effective. That combined with some of the other things we've done, we've seen a, a drastic decrease in at least one uh, disease that was common, not only at rainbow trout in Utah, but it's, it's fairly common really around the world. Oh, that's uh, awesome. It's, yeah. It's, we've, we've been really successful here in Utah. You know, people have talked about back in the day, there was the whirling disease outbreaks. Is that, I guess your work has kind of helped decrease that in Utah. We, we do a lot of work with whirling disease. You know, that, that really became a, a major problem in the 90s and uh, is still an issue. We test for that. all the, When we do an inspection, when I talk about parasitology, that is typically one of the things we're looking for, trying to determine if, if fish are infected. And if they are, that is one of the prohibited pathogens in the state that prevents us from, from moving fish between locations. I wish I could say we've reduced the, the spread, but unfortunately it's the type of parasite that moves very easily with, with anglers, with birds, with animals. So we've, we've made a difference. We're pretty good at managing it, but it, it unfortunately is fairly widespread. We do a lot of work with whirling disease. We really gotcha. do. And with something like that, you're kind of, once we detect it somewhere, you're helping to combat that. Like you said, you can't always necessarily prevent it, but we try with our health certifications and stuff like that before fish are moved. Exactly. We use those health certifications and inspections to do the best we can to manage around that pathogen. So we kind of talked about the disease side of things. So you mentioned the other component is research along, you know, with coming up vaccines for some of the diseases, what are some of the other things that you guys are helping to research up here? And, and you know, that's a really great question. Our, our research program has grown significantly over the years. One of the most unique things about the program is that it changes from year to year. In fact, it, it oftentimes it changes from month to month. We put together an annual work plan that is based on research requests out of all the regions throughout the state and in many cases beyond, uh, throughout the West, uh, even nationally, depending on 
what might be needed or what some of the questions might be that we need to answer. Just to give you a couple of examples of some of the projects we're working on that I think are, are pretty unique, we've become more involved with bioenergetics modeling over the past couple of years. And really what that is, it's, it's us sending our research crew out to uh, one of the regions, working directly collaboratively with them to better understand the predator-prey relationships in, in reservoirs and the food webs so that we can better manage the programs both for sport fish and non-sport fish populations. Yeah, what are some other kind of interesting things you've discovered in your research here over the years or projects that you're working on? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, it's, it seems like there's always an ongoing project. I mentioned the vaccine. Just to give you a little more background on that cold water disease issue, because this is such a great collaboration between fish health and, and research, when we were experiencing these disease problems, we, at one point, it's primarily rainbow trout that are susceptible to the bacteria. Through our research efforts, we were able to reduce the number of infections, which at that point were about 60 cases a year, which represented essentially every rainbow trout. We've reduced that down to about four or five a year. Oh, wow. And, and that has really been just a significant combination of lots and lots of research that I won't go into today because it's, it's the vaccine, it's biosecurity, it's, it's a, a long laundry list of things that we've done, but that's been really significant. I mentioned the bioenergetics modeling. In addition to that, we have an employee now that's on staff who works directly with the AIS program, so the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. With like uh, quagga mussels and stuff. Yeah, we've talked about that. That's exactly right. And uh, he's, a, he's a part of the program trying to address the issue on many levels, you know, trying to figure out how we reduce, just like pathogens, how do we reduce the spread and how do we increase monitoring. And one of those things that uh, that we utilize to make that happen is well, we'll be eDNA testing, and that's basically going out to the environment, collecting samples, extracting DNA, and then basically trying to identify is a is an AIS species present at, at that location. Oh, I see. And so you help detect if there's suspected new locations. We are we are part of the preliminary phase of those kind of projects. So uh, Skyler, who's in who's in charge of that program here at the station. He would be a, a part of, you know, the development of those assays and how they're used throughout the system. Another thing that ties directly to AIS, he's going to be a part of a New Zealand mud snail treatment. It's a, a chemical that's found commercially that we're going to utilize at our Springville hatchery to see if we can eliminate that in a true hatchery situation. So if you think about it, if a hatchery is invaded by an invasive species and we have a way to eliminate it, what a, what a great approach throughout the state if for that AIS species and, and any others that we may encounter if, if we can find another treatment that will be as effective. That's awesome. And that yeah. makes a lot of sense to me because I mentioned we did a previous episode kind of exploring the Springville fish hatchery and kind of what fish hatcheries do and how they work. And they do grow a ton of fish that we then stock. <laughs> and so that would be pretty detrimental if there's some kind of invasive species or bacteria or whatever that killed all those fish potentially. Like that's pretty expensive and a, a lot of time and, and effort lost. And so, yeah, that's really important <laughs> to it, have what you guys are doing. It's it's a real challenge. And, and luckily, the mud snails that we're talking about, at least at Springville, they won't kill the fish, but... They're another prohibited species, so we can't transfer them around the state. So gotcha. it, we've got to figure out a way to eliminate them. We have some protocols in place that prevent us from inadvertently transferring them, but the best case scenario is that we could eliminate them completely, and then you don't have to worry about those protocols. You just constantly monitor and do the best you can to make sure you're just not transferring those species anywhere. Gotcha. Very similar to fish health work. Right. So with your research, I mean, it, you guys are kind of, it sounds like the fixers of every <laughs> aquatic problem in the state. It sounds like people have questions or issues, they call you guys. You know, if somebody does have an issue or they have a question, are they usually just sending you up a sample or a fish or how does that work? Because I know you were showing me some of your, you have little DNA stuff and all sorts of stuff to do your research. So how, yeah, how do you usually get those samples for your research? That, that is a great question. And I, and I'll tell you that it's really a mix of a little bit of everything. I have folks that'll call me out of the regions and say, you know, I've got a photograph of a fish that I just found. I've had anglers call me and, you know, typically if we can get a sample that's fresh and we have an opportunity to determine if in fact it was bacterial or some other water chemistry issue, then we can go down that road. The other ones are more organized when we talk about the fish health inspections. You know, we, we know when we're going to be going to 
these locations and, and doing these types of inspections. And then there's just the oddball questions, as you mentioned. You know, we oftentimes I, I viewed myself as just that. We are the folks in the aquatic section that are troubleshooting. If somebody in the region or a Salt Lake office comes up with a question they don't have an answer to, you get, off, oftentimes you, you they say some, uh, oftentimes they'll say, you know, you better call Wade and let's see, or call FES and let's see if we can figure this out. And it's interesting because in some cases you're kind of making it up as you go along. You're, sure. you're collaborating with other, other employees that do the same thing across the West to try and identify these problems. And good example, I just got a call from Colorado where they were asking the same thing. They had an official scenario that they couldn't explain and they were calling me to see if I had ever seen anything along those lines. So it's, oh, interesting. It's great to see have this program in Utah and it's also great to have such great collaborations throughout the West because we all work as a team to try and address all these issues. Sure. And I mean, yeah. that makes sense because you have a lot of the same species too that you're working on and trying to, to do. So you're like the fish IT guy, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So obviously the bulk of your work up here, like we've talked about, is you know the research side, the health you know inspection side. Talk about, you also mentioned the cultures. Is that included in the health inspections or is that totally separate so uh fish culture here at the station you mean right yeah so fish culture at the station uh, again your your listeners can't see this but if you walk around the station you'll see that we were originally built as more of an experiment based station so we have very small raceways that allows us to do replication and research that's really changed over the years we now have a very large fairly diverse program very similar to other hatcheries We raise a lot of rainbow trout for just stocking purposes for the anglers. We raise cutthroat trout annually for uh, conservation efforts. And then as you walk around, you see that we're working with bluehead suckers, june suckers. We're going to be back into raising uh, leather side and leash chub here. Well, maybe not leash chub, but we've done some of that in the past. So kind of some of the more threatened, sensitive, endangered type species, trying to help bolster those populations as well. That's exactly right. Very unique program, very diverse. And I think there's some interest in the near future as they rebuild the hatchery here that they're going to start getting into some warm water species, looking at hybrid striped bass, tiger muskie, and and even walleyes. In the future, it's going to be a very diverse program, even from what we see today. So you're not doing the bulk of the fish growing like some of our other hatcheries around the state, but you are doing some here. Yes, yes, exactly. So it's a it's a mix of everything. Just a small, uh, may, maybe half is for just general production. Gotcha. Yeah. And with so with the June suckers, you guys are the only ones that raise them locally here in the state. That's correct. And how long have you been doing June sucker work? I know that's kind of been in the news recently because they were proposed for downlisting recently, and they're starting to do a lot better, you know, due to a lot of these efforts. It started before my time, well before my time, but I want to say, I think it's just over 20 years. Oh, okay. It, it may so be it's a been bit, a while. It's been a while, yeah. I've been here for 15, and the program was well established. Kind of as you mentioned, as we walked around, some of these buildings are quite old, uh-huh. so there's talks of maybe upgrading some of the facilities, moving locations, which would be exciting. And I guess would that allow you guys to expand as well, some of the projects that you're doing? It, it really would. And that's when we talk about rebuilding the hatchery, that in itself, you know, we are right in the middle of their proposed progress. For well, them th- to expand. For too. them to expand. So once FES moves from this location, this hatchery here will be then called the Logan Fish Hatchery. And yes, it'll allow them to expand and then it'll allow us to do the same thing. Because as you, as you toured around, you notice that the offices are a bit disjointed because we just fill in space where we can. The lab space is, is a bit dated. It works for what we do, but there's definitely some real challenges there. And if we can move down the road, which is our ultimate plan, we will then be able to rebuild the research wet lab, the, the fish health lab, and the administrative component associated with, with FES itself. That's awesome. And kind of switching gears a little bit. So since you guys do a lot of the health certification for our different hatcheries before they can stock and move fish, let's talk a little bit about aquaponics. That's something that I've kind of heard thrown around a lot more. It seems like it's becoming more trendy as kind of Mm -hmm. urban farming and, you know, backyard chickens is becoming a thing. So are there a lot of people here locally in the state that try to kind of do their own aquaponics farming? And if so, is that something that you are also involved in helping to regulate as far as the fish health? 
You know, that, that really is a great question. So aquaponics is, is regulated through the Department of Agriculture. Okay. And really what aquaponics is, is just a combination of raising aquatic animals and plants together. And as I mentioned earlier, as we were walking around, there's two ways that we culture fish with the Division of Wildlife. And that is flow through system where water comes in, goes across the fish and then goes out. All the wastewater is removed. Or you have recirculating system where you have basically a, a biological filter that removes any toxic component when you reuse the water. Well, that's where aquaponics comes in. The plants actually serve to remove some of the toxic component the plants can use utilize for food. It's like a natural filter that, and it's using the fish exactly. waste as food, right? Yeah, very, very cool concept. And there's a lot of activity not only in Utah, but throughout the United States and beyond where a lot of hobbyists are becoming more involved in it. I don't have a number for you here in Utah, but I do know that there are quite a few people that are interested, a lot of people doing it in their backyard, out in their garages. And I, I, I don't know of any major commercial programs, but I know there's some interest, you know, and if the one thing that we do is always try and promote aquaculture opportunities. We're not as involved with what happens in private aquaculture, but if we ever have an opportunity to try and promote, you know, business or aquaculture components throughout the state, we always we always try and step in and, and help. That's awesome. Yeah. And and like you'd mentioned, so the Department of Agriculture is the one that's mainly responsible for overseeing that. If if some private person did have kind of a fish disease outbreak, is that something we'd maybe be called in to Prob look into? Yeah, probably not. So uh, in the past years ago, we were, and, and this is probably 30 years ago, we were in charge of doing fish health testing for the Division of Wildlife and for private aquaculture. Oh, we were. It, we were. And over time, that had changed. They were transferred over to the Department of Agriculture. So the way it works now they have people that go to private facilities, they collect samples like we had mentioned, and they, they give their certification. Now, if they run into a sick fish scenario, they have a couple of opportunities. One, they, they call the Department of Agriculture for some advice, and the other one is to work with a local veterinarian that can help them identify what the problem might be. And I've got to say, that makes sense to me. You guys are involved in a lot of other things, so right, that, that would right. spread you a little thin, because how many hatcheries do we have here in the state? Let's see. I believe with our warm water facilities, the way they've they've kind of expanded and changed, I believe we're up to 13 now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah. And you're you're primarily doing the testing and, and research for those facilities. We are, yeah. For the most part. Okay. Well, it is a, a pretty impressive operation that you guys have up here for sure. And I mean, before today, I honestly, I knew almost next to nothing about <laughs> what you guys do. So I appreciate you taking a minute to kind of educate me and some of our listeners on, on some of the stuff that we do up here. And for those listening, as always, if you haven't yet, we'd love if you could subscribe to The Wild Podcast. We release a new episode on the third Tuesday of each month. So we hope that you will join in next month for some more wildlife stories. <laughs>